Okay, good. Um, so we'll just get started. And if you can begin introducing yourself a little bit, tell us a bit about yourself, Emma. Well, um, I'm Emma Hagedorn and I'm originally from the Philippines and I'm now living in France. And my background, uh, mostly in my um, education, uh, educational work, I, I had experienced with different levels, but um, I was focusing on younger children, early childhood. Okay. So I chose to, um, this, um, this work because I'm, I'm very passionate about children and it leads me to really discover myself also and, and communicating with different um, children and different nationalities. And it's very... Uh, a joyful experience for me so far. There's a lot of uh, pros and cons as well, of course, like any other work. But for me personally, I really enjoy this this, this job. Good. And what yeah. do you teach? Well, basically, um, it's uh, English, which covers a lot of things like science, arts, right. music, dancing, yeah. you know, you, you name that. And so we followed a certain curriculum in my last school. And then um, we apply that in the classroom. And basically that's how we form the, the learning environment for the, 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 basically mine was like babies, you know, really, right, okay. really, really uh, young, 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 younger children. Okay. Um, and you said you, you discovered yourself, you learned a lot about yourself when you got into teaching. So what, uh, what did you learn about yourself through that process? What have you discovered? Well, a lot of things because um, the world of, of the children are quite different from us, you know, like adult wise. And sometimes we may tend to be really serious about a lot of things if you look at it and you interact with young, younger children, you can find that you're laughing at their little scenarios and little um, silly faces. And it's just really, really uh, melting. Yeah. Because uh, it, it's innocent, the innocent, and it's like they're sinless and you just don't get serious about that. You actually become a child yourself as well which okay, is yeah, I think yeah. most of us we need that as well sure yeah, that makes sense yeah i think that's true yeah also uh patience you know yeah. you, when you work with young children you need to have that it's not easy to manage a bunch of kids in the classroom with different nationalities some of them really doesn't speak english right. and some of them have tantrums once in a while yeah and so. you're one only maybe you have some assistant, but it's not the same as you actually doing the whole job, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I was focusing on this, like everything, the emotional, their connect, cognitive, their social, and most especially, um, make them, um, concentrate in, in one topic that we need to, to finish. Right. And sometimes even if you prepare a good, um, topic for the day, sometimes it just doesn't work because, one situation may come up and you need to yeah. adjust yourself, you know? Yeah, so, right. yeah. No, yeah, that's, I think the adaptability, the patience, um, and also the lightheartedness, you know, the ability to um, function on the same level as the children and, and uh, laugh and joke with them at their, at their level. Um, are particular, a particular set of skills for teaching early years. Um, I think patience in particular, patience is something that I think all teachers need. Um, and I found I've got a little bit of experience trying to teach, uh, early, early years learners. And I wasn't very good at it. Um, that wasn't terrible, but it certainly is not my strength. You know, it's not, not in my wheelhouse. Um, I wonder what you think, what your opinion is, 
Um, do you think anybody can teach at that level or do you think that uh, it's just something some people don't have access to? No, I personally believe that it's not for everybody at all. No. Um, you know, when we go to university, we choose our major and blah, blah, blah. And I think one of these things you need to really look at yourself, what you want to do when you take this kind of field, because it takes yeah. a lot of courage and commitment and patience. And I don't think just anybody can do it. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I agree. People, yeah. No, go on. Some people are, are made, to, let's say, university level because yes, they are good right. at it you know some people are are good at um adult like corporation uh one-on-one -on -one or, or depends but certain age like two years old up to four years old it's it's really really critical there so yeah that's right yeah, i don't think it's for everybody that's right no i agree it requires such a skill set such a specific skill set um and i do so I do a lot of teacher training. Um, mm -hmm. I don't do training for the early years because as I said, it's mm -hmm. not, it's not an area of my strength. So I can't, I can't do it very well. I can't train somebody else to do it. Um, but as a trainer, um, uh, it's often assumed that my opinion is supposed to be um, anybody can teach if they get the right training. Um, right. And I don't think that. I, I <laughs> think that um, even teaching in general, not just for, for young learners, but all teaching, I think that there are, people there are some people who who don't have what it takes to be a good teacher and you can train a teacher and make them a better teacher um but i don't think just anybody can teach and i find in language teaching especially um as an english teacher um the assumption often is if you can speak english then you can teach english uh, and uh -huh. i very strongly disagree with that yeah. and then to go from that point to the to the next step of teaching young children um, is such a, a, a level of challenge that I don't think the majority of people could just step into that, even even with training and, and, the, and the educational background. I don't think it's for everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, your, um, the trainer that you've done is the for what level is just... A, a I basically pitch it for anything above early years. So if you're kind of middle, if you're, if you're planning to teach middle school all the way up to adult, um, you know, whether that's further education, corporate training, any level, um, then I think that it applies. Um, and I also say, I, when I'm, you know, I try to be as, as straightforward as I can. So I also say, if you, if you have no teaching experience, um, then the training that I offer will provide you some value, even if you're going to teach young learners, but you need much more than I offer. Um, and what I suggest sometimes is you take my course to get a foundation in, in teaching, but then you would need to specialize after that and take another specialized course for early years, um, which I think um, is now, at least in the EFL industry, the, the language teaching industry, I think that's quite standard now. Um, and it's becoming more standard. It's becoming better recognized yeah. in the mainstream schooling as well, I think. But I don't think that that's always been the common belief. In fact, yeah. I don't know what it's like in the Philippines. I don't know what it's like in France. But um, where I work here in Indonesia, it's often been considered quite the opposite. A lot of new teachers, when they just graduate, they move into uh, childhood teaching first, early years teaching first huh. to get their experience. And then as they kind of, um, as they gain more experience, they tend to move then up to teaching in the, in the upper years and huh. there's almost there's almost here a sense of promotion like you know the the more advanced the more experienced <laughs> teachers will eventually move up to teaching at the college level and that's where they get the most respect and it's where they get paid yeah. the most um and i think it, it should almost be the opposite uh yeah right? oh that's good to know i i didn't know about that mm, no i mean the philippines is quite different as well i mean um um I took my tassel in the Philippines way okay. back years, years ago. And um, my experience was in elementary level, primary, but younger as well. 
but um, prior that time, uh, mostly online education. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah, with the Korean students, um, uh, Japanese students, Italian students. So, but when you have we actually when you go abroad and you're planning to go abroad and really have a bigger experience, you need to have a TAFL or whatever. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, because, you know, it's something. Yeah. And most schools, they're, they're, they're looking at that and they require that, especially if you're um, non-native or, you know. So, yes, and then um, in the Philippines, you need to really have a specialized um, education for early years. Right. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah. I, say, I think that's becoming more standard now. I don't think it's always been the case, but it, I, I think that's now relatively standard, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's not just like, okay, you're, a, you're an English teacher and then, okay, we'll hire you for, uh, you know, um, preschool um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, job and like that. No, it, it, it's more, um, I think it's more specialized and really, you know, a bit um, not open compared to ESL teacher yeah. or university level. Yeah. So there's a lot of competition as well in, in the field. Sure. Yeah, I can imagine yeah, that would be. Yeah. 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 And and also, I mean, one of the things I think that an important difference you've already mentioned, um, kind of getting on the same level as the kids, so that you can share their humor and laugh with them. Um, yeah. Definitely, just the ability to communicate because at almost every other level in middle school, there's still a bit of a, a bit of a gap. But certainly, when you get to secondary or high school and above that, um, you're basically communicating on the same level. Of course, there's a difference exactly. between an adult and a teenager, but you mm -hmm. have the same understanding of the world. You have the same basic grasp of the language that you're using. But when you're dealing Hi. with young learners, there's an entire cognitive difference, right? That you need to bridge that gap, um, which again adds a, a level of challenge that not just anybody can can overcome. I think just being able to um, understand the perspective of the of the young learners. I, I agree with that um, because um, as I've mentioned earlier, it's not for everybody and someone sh not just specialize in that learning field, but experience as well. And you need to have an empathy and, and yeah. compassion yeah. to actually connect with, yeah. with little children because they are vulnerable. They are more sensitive. Right. And they need a second mother. Right. Or you know, this kind of connection is more like emotion in a way. Yeah. You need to be connected with them. So um, most of the teachers that I've known just one week of teaching in an early, uh, early childhood classroom, they're, they're beat. You know, it's yeah, just. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it, yeah really so um yeah it's not just you you're not going to be there just for the money you need to have a heart right. yeah to work yeah definitely field. definitely so, yeah yeah and you yeah. mentioned you mentioned second mother there um which i think is true what do you think that i mean definitely i mean i've not done any research but i've been around the the uh the context long enough to recognize there are definitely more female teachers in the early years um segment right uh what do you think about that do you think that there the women female teachers are better matched to the early years or do you think it doesn't matter what's your opinion on that i think in a way yes because um we have this um intuition you know motherhood intuition and especially when you become a mother um you know exactly what the child needs and mm -hmm. why she's acted up like that or why she has the tantrums yeah. or why she's having a bad day you know as an adult you have to level down yourself right. to the situation of the kid yeah. to understand actually what's going on you know yeah and in order for you to do that you have that kind of connection with the child as i think yeah. as as a woman 
and as a mother, it's easy for us to actually recognize yeah. the problem so yeah. we can approach it easily. Yeah. So yeah, yes. there does seem there does seem to be a difference to me. I mean, when I've done recruiting um, before, I've often been uh, a little bit annoyed, and I'll usually I'll usually make my annoyance known uh, when a school insists or, or specifies that they want a female teacher for their early years. Um, when I'm recruiting teachers, I try to be as as equal opportunities as I can. And when a school mm. uh, approaches me and says that we want to we want to hire an early years teacher and we specifically want a woman, a, a female teacher, um, then I will usually um, I'll usually respond to that, uh, you know, and disagree with that. However, um, I also fully expect there to be more female candidates. And I, pr and I also predict that I'll probably end up hiring a female, but there are of course some great male. Uh, yes. Yes. I agree. I, I think, yeah. But I think anybody would be, would be uh, foolish to suggest that there's not, there's not a difference. I think there's something. It, yeah. Yeah. Going yeah. On. Yeah. There's yeah. quite a lot of difference. And, and also, it's the fact that the parents right that's true that's you know, very prefer true prefer to yeah, have a female uh, um, teacher you know handling yeah. the the children yeah. so yes so i think that's one of the pressure in there as well yeah no i think that's true and you also obviously mentioned about becoming a mother do you uh, find were you teaching before you uh, before you became a parent no no oh, okay. um I already, I mean, I, I've begun my teaching when, after I, I right, okay, my, okay. Um, so what kind of influence do you, do you suspect that has? Do you think being a parent changes uh, the way you might be a teacher? Do you think it has any influence or, or the other way? Do you think there's anything about being a parent that you've learned from being a teacher? I think it's, it's all of the, all about those uh, bits and pieces, you know, it just actually, coming in together and once you become a parent and you just discovered an endless love to this little creature and you just don't know how and 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 suddenly your your perspective in a way changes as well yeah. and you know you become more matured and and things differently than before and make a decision differently than before so i yeah. think it also covers those those things and when you become a parent also you are thinking okay these children are the future right and you're also thinking okay i would love my son or my daughter to have a great experience in school yeah, course, yeah. and also have an equal opportunity to this education you know this kind of question and so we we tried to apply that as an educator and so yeah, yeah. you know we we balance ourselves and we adapt ourselves to the situation so i think yes i agree that it, it actually changed you as a person yeah, and, yeah. and overall so if if something that changed in you inside i think the rest will follow yeah, sure. Yeah, and no, I agree. It's a good observation. I wonder, or not wonder, I mean, um, it's a, as you've already said, it's a critical, it's a critical age. And there's so much more responsibility, I think. I mean, we want to have good teachers at all levels. Um, and again, obviously, the work that I do, um, you know, is an attempt to make sure we've got good teachers at every level of the of the school experience. But if we're being honest, you know, ultimately you can get away with a couple of bad teachers in your upper upper school years if you have a bad teacher you know it's not ideal and it's going to cause perhaps some some problem but it's not perhaps a, as big of an impact as if you have a bad teacher an ineffective teacher in the early years um where the yeah. child is still developing and still forming their 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 personhood um there's a bigger do you feel a sense of responsibility in that way a lot yeah. Yes, yes. I think um, every teacher should feel the same way because um, um, it's a sensitive um, work, at least for me, and uh, I really take my job seriously. 
and it's stressful in a way, but you need to enjoy yourself, you know, in order for you to actually sure. be an effective sure. teacher. And um, I love my children so much. And, and even if you, when you, when you go to bed, you're, you're still thinking, you know, what you're going to do the next day. And if, if someone was having a bad day that time, what, what would the problem, you know, this kind of thing. So I think, um, that period of every children is really crucial and we need to take a look at that most especially how they're going to um enjoy themselves even if they're they're young yeah, you know right uh so as much as possible i try to incorporate a lot of plays yeah playing good. playing playing and you know the they have to enjoy what we're doing and if they're bored you need to also to change other topics you yeah, know for right. them to be really engaged yeah and of course um communication with parents is vital too mm -hmm. so whatever happens in the classroom like things that the parents should know you should communicate with them as much as possible right. because right. for me it, it's crucial as well sure. so this kind yeah. of relationship you know parents and teachers especially with early years it's really really important yeah yeah it's good i've found um in recent years i found some tension um there in my own thinking because i spent quite a lot of time talking about the value of getting parents involved um yeah and again uh, i I tend to work with the the upper years, so the the mm -hmm. you know the the middle school and upper, yeah. um, and I have advocated for a long time uh, for more parent parental involvement um, and more communication to the parents. Um, but then I've also, as I say in recent years, I've also seen, especially here in Indonesia, with the the system here, and and um, I know other countries are like this, especially countries that have a a, a heavily privatized system um, yeah. often the, the the parents have i would say too much power because they're mm. paying school fees um and the mm. school often uh feels beholden to follow the demands of the parents um because they rely on the funding from the parents um exactly. but often you know parents they're not great educators in a lot of cases they're not trained teachers they don't necessarily know That's what's true. good for education but they have That's very true. strong opinions and, and very high That's demands true. Um, and so I've, I've found a bit of tension uh, lately between wanting to get parents very involved, but then also wanting to undermine some of that unearned power that the parents have. Um, and it seems that the key there, although it's a long process, is educating the parents. So getting them involved, but also getting them more aware and more making sure the parents understand uh, why the school is doing things that it's doing, uh, which again, I, I think is a, a role that can be played very well in the early years. So what kind of, how do you work with your parents? What kind of interactions do you have with the parents? What kind of, do you, do you have any specific <clears throat> parental activities and things like that? Uh, based on my experience, um, well, international school, private school, as mm. you said, you know, mostly the principal or the owner of the school will rely with parents but yes in that case yes uh, lots lots of pressure from the parents and we as teachers sometimes we need to kind of fight like right. you know what we're doing here is according to curriculum and you know we know what we're doing and blah 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 and not all parents but some parents are <laughs> really hard to manage at times yeah yeah but yeah. again I I've experienced really worse worst scenario but mm -hmm. i've handled it in a good way and and i try to be professional as much as i can and at the end of the day you're not delivering your service only to the parents but especially to the children right so um at the end of the day i would ask myself i believe i did a good job and i think that the child is really learning well um at times, uh, what I did was direct communication with parents. Mm. 
right. if I want to say something that is, uh, let's say, kind of a problem, then, of course, I need to address that first to, right. to the principal, right? And then right, we will have yeah. a meeting. We will have a meeting and we will discuss this. And we have a parent-teachers conference and this and that. And we have uh, a lot of meetings as well. But at the end of the day, after school, I always meet the parents. Right. Okay. And just that direct communication. Hey, how are you? Um, oh, you know, she cried today, this and that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't wait too long to discuss yeah, this right. little thing because sure. it's not fresh anymore. And, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if you yeah. have a good, and it builds uh, up, right? You you end up yeah, exactly. putting together five small things, and it becomes a very big problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah rather than yeah, yeah no, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So um, I try to be as compassionate as I can with the parents as well, and understand their point of view. And um, if I want to say something, they also respect that in a way. Yeah. Right. It's very important to have that respect you know yeah and um if one parent would actually criticize what you're doing in the classroom it's probably you have to stand a point that this and that this and that and so they would say okay i agree yeah. and good compromise yeah. Yeah, i think it's important people. to remember that obviously the parents are always coming from a place of good intentions right they mm -hmm. they in a lot of cases they don't necessarily know what's the best approach for a particular yeah. situation um yeah but obviously they care about their children and they want what's best for their yeah. children sure. the, the challenge is they don't necessarily know yeah. what's best for their children they just know yeah. that they're not happy about something um and so any criticism that comes from the parents i think it can be frustrating for a teacher you know when you're a a competent, trained, educated, experienced teacher, um, and yeah. you're getting criticism that doesn't make sense. It can be frustrating, but um, mm -hmm. we have to recognize where it comes from, which is a, a you know a yes, place of caring exactly. for their children, right? Um, yes. And if you, as you've said, if you can have that relationship of respect with the parents, it's going to be a much easier conversation to have, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And another thing I've found as well is one of the a, a kind of I don't think there's a big magic answer, but one of the partial solutions I think is um, communicating positively to the parents as well, where certainly when I was in school, um, the kind of the biggest threat was always, we'll call your parents. If you do something naughty, we'll send a letter to your parents or we'll call your parents. And that was always sort of the biggest kind of threat of punishment was we'll tell your parents. Um, and I think that something schools don't do generally and teachers often don't do is um communicating with the parents when something good happens and sending back information to the parents that the, the child has performed well has achieved mm. something as you know i was surprised by something good that your child did uh there's only ever bad news coming from the parents which uh, sorry, yeah. sorry coming from the teachers which tends to set mm. up a kind of a combative relationship where the parents always having to defend their child against the teacher and there's always a confrontation a conflict um they're both they're both trying to get the best for the child but it turns into yeah. a conflict rather than a cooperation i think yeah exactly i agree with that and another thing is like some parents as well they're they're uh, putting so much pressure Yes, you know, right. teacher, and like they're expecting that the teacher will give everything. Like right. the child cannot learn everything with the teacher. Right. And right. I always explain before the starts of the school, like to, to to all the parents, and I said, parents, mommy, daddies, you know, in order for me to really um, work this out, I want you to get involved with your children's mm. education. I'm not asking you to do the whole day um, project or learning with your child, but in a way, try to be with them. Yeah. And that's, that's a lot of um, helpful, you know, because so I, I understand that um, lots of parents are busy working yeah. and, and I understand, but most of the time they don't have enough time to spend their child yeah, and right. expecting one teacher would cover everything and they would right. 
argue and, and criticize the teacher why my child is not learning or or why it's like this was like that you know it's not a magic you know yeah it's yeah. a process so yeah, that's right you have to involve yourself as well because the first learning that a child can get is inside home of course yeah that's right i, I and, spend a lot yeah. of time with my teachers um kind of advocating for the idea that we want our students to become lifelong learners we want them to value learning so that the students um have a desire to go on learning after they leave the classroom when they go home yeah. they want to keep learning and after they graduate they want to keep learning but uh, and, and so we can do a lot about that in the classroom as teachers we can do a lot to to build that mentality to develop that that culture amongst our students but if at home they're not really encouraged to to learn if the parents aren't encouraging them to have that attitude about learning especially yeah. you know right from the early years if it's not something that's encouraged um it's going to be very difficult for the teacher yeah. to develop that as a as a new concept to students who don't really think much about learning um outside of the classroom yeah exactly exactly because the early years especially as we said is the crucial part of the children's uh, process of learning in their formative years and so right. and they're developing their 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 personality and their attitude exactly. at that point right not just yeah, what they're yeah. learning but who they're becoming right? yeah yeah exactly so their iq and eq as well so it should be you know balanced so if the parents would really let's say knows about these things and help the teacher as well it would be great for everybody right you know, you know so yeah of course yeah it's a long way to go, but I think um, we are in the generation now that we should highlight this also with a lot of institutions, schools, researchers, and you know this kind of thing because it's it's important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think research and education has um, it's in a pretty early stage, right? kind of good good quality educational research there's always been something going on but i think we're in a, a stage now where uh, re educational research is beginning to develop into something valuable but in my opinion it's still very kind of early and uh, it's good to see more and we need to have more and yeah. but a lot of the research that comes out at the moment um sometimes mm -hmm. it's not perhaps that valuable so there's a lot of there's a long way to go with educational research i think yeah exactly and in your area in in indonesia is that right yeah. so it is like more like international schools or we have a we well? have a big variety here so there's there's a public school system which is government owned free schools um and certainly the majority of the national population is in public school is is in government school um because it's a huge population there's there's over 300 million people here um and so the you know and it's mostly rural uh as okay. a country so the vast majority of the population are in public schools government schools um but i live in and i work in jakarta and i spend now most of my time in the cities so jakarta officially the capital city and then there's a few other kind of big cities a handful of big cities and then most of the country is small towns and rural areas uh, so in the big cities you have a variety then of private schools and uh international schools in jakarta especially there's a lot of international schools so where i am there's a there's quite a variety and a lot of children okay. in jakarta are in private schools um but that's not Jak jakarta doesn't represent the whole country it's quite different yeah. once you get outside of the capital um but the the there's a, the, a massive variety then as well because in the uk we have a mostly uh you know, the vast majority of our system is, is yeah. um, public schools and there are some private schools which are considered elite schools they're expensive and only a very tiny kind of uh, wealthy minority yeah. uh, go to the private schools generally speaking so all of those schools are kind of high performing schools they're elite schools and the people that graduate from those schools tend to end up in uh, elite professions here in indonesia the private school system is quite large 
Um, a lot of kids are in private school, especially in, as I say, in the big cities, a lot of kids are in private schools, but there's a huge range. There are some very, very low quality private schools that are cheap mm -hmm. and have, you know, very kind of poor facilities, as well mm -hmm. as some very, very expensive uh, international private schools and international schools, uh, which are more like the British private schools. They're elite okay. schools, they're expensive, they have yeah. very fancy modern facilities, but a very, very few children are actually in those schools. Most are in public schools or low quality, uh, cheaper private schools. Is it like, uh, like you have like early years, like um, only early years school or it's like um, from early to, you know, primary? It's, it's a mixed bag, I think. Um, in the private school sector, um, I think as a school expands and becomes more popular and becomes more uh, successful, earns more money, they have a bigger budget, as they expand, they then tend to populate the other mm -hmm. levels. So they might mm -hmm. begin as a middle school um, and then as they get more students, they become more popular, they might open a secondary school, a, a high school, mm -hmm. so that the students can graduate into the high school. And then as they expand and get more, more successful, they might then open an early year school as well, uh, you know, maybe a primary school and then a kindergarten. Um, so I think as the school expands, they tend to eventually have the whole uh, the whole range but yeah. when a, a new school opens a new private school opens then they usually specialize in one sector so there's a lot of schools that are just elementary schools uh, primary schools and it's just a standalone school so if you go to that school and then you you reach year six grade six then after that grade uh, you would have to find a new school you'd have to move somewhere else and find a new school okay. because this school doesn't have a secondary school that's the right. that's what most schools are like Okay, right. Well, in the school of my son is a well. He's twelve years old, so he's not a a, a kitty anymore. It's it's a international school. Um, kindergarten up to secondary, secondary. Right, right. And because they have a different kind of system here, so sure. it's kind of really confusing in a way. But yeah, they don't have a preschool preschool like the one okay. in thailand in thailand it's so common um even a two-year-old baby can can actually enroll wow i know and it's funny but it when i say my students th those are my students you know right they're yeah, wow. babies yeah wow, wow. And so uh, what do you youngest, think about that do you think that that's is that a valuable is that a, a good way of spending time for, for a two-year-old? What do you think? Uh, my personal my, my personal belief is, um, no, I, the, no. The, the kid should be with her mom, you know, should yeah. be at home with her mom and enjoying, you know, this kind yeah. of connection. Yeah. It's too young. It's too young yeah. to be in school. Yeah, I, and, I think so too. Um, yeah, it, it's really, really difficult because they're first time, they're so, so young, they're crying and it's, it's really messy. Yeah. What is the educational objective there? What does the school claim that they can achieve at that age? I mean, you can't expect to be teaching them a lot. They can't be learning history and maths and, you know, I mean, what's the actual kind of, uh, public stated objective at that at that age it depends actually um it's becoming a trend over there and so a lot of international schools started to follow that trend it's also because a lot of expat parents are working right yeah and they'd rather have oh, they, they'd rather send the the kid to school rather than it's more like a know, daycare than family. anything else exactly yeah, right. i see yeah and sure. so sure. Yeah, basically that, and also they putting a lot of pressure to the kid. Like, mm -hmm. I want my child to learn like this. I want my yeah, child right. to like. Come on. Yeah, my You're my so take on this, and and it's not that young here. Um, although some of the extracurricular, like the language centers and the tutor, the tuition centers, um, they have they have two, maybe not two year old, but three year old. 
programs. Mm. Um, my take on it, or what I've seen of it is the parents believe that they're getting a head start, right? That they're, they're kind of, exactly. if, we, if we get our kid in earlier, they get a head start, they'll have a better chance of, of, of achieving high grades later. Um, and I think that that's such a misguided approach because not only do I think that you're not going to get a head start because there's not much value, you know, there's no learning value. They're not going to, they're not going to get a head start yeah. in maths or biology yeah. or anything like yeah. that anyway. Um, and then on the other hand, I think that potentially, again, I, I don't know if there's research on this, but I would think that potentially there is some possibly some developmental cost there at the child not being in a comfortable environment with their parents. Um, you know, I can imagine that that could have potentially some negative impact on their development. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I mean, some of the parents are not working and stay at home parents mm. and some international school, they will have a CCTV. So the and, parents watching them. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right, yeah. Why don't we just like take care, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, you know, like yeah, it's it's just so funny. Like mm, I I don't get it, but wait, hey, it's my job. <laughs> right. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, uh, I think I, I would disagree with that because um, yeah, it, it's not really totally good for for the baby at yeah. that age. It's so yeah. young. Sure. It's I just, it seems to me <laughs> to indicate what you can expect. I mean, those parents are presumably going to be the parents that place a lot of pressure on the kid as they grow up as well. So that when they're in middle school, um, presumably those parents are going to be placing a lot of pressure on them for good grades and, you know, achieve high achieving in school. It's, it's likely to be the parents that are making that decision at two years old and three years old. They're going to be the same parents that are pushing perhaps too hard in the in the later years as well so it can't spell good things for the for the the social mm -hmm. development and the emotional development of that child right? no no it, it's a it's a big business it's a big business and at yeah, the end of the day right. it, you know we're talking about money and uh yeah so for me i just don't understand sometimes but uh i hope there will be a school that you know, the parent will go to that school. It's like a school parenting, a parenting school. And yeah, I think, yeah. You know, about the like things, yeah. you know. Yeah. <laughs> this is why I say, you know, I think, no, I think it would. And, and this is why I think that schools should begin to take that responsibility on to some degree where instead of the only, you know, at the moment, the only relationship between the, the, the school and the parent is um, the school complains to the parent if the child is naughty. And the parent complains to the school if they're not happy about something. So there's, mm. there's just this kind of back and forth of, of complaints yeah. between the two sides. But if the school took more of a responsibility, more of an active role in trying to inform the parents and educate the parents so that the parents knew some of the pedagogy, some of the, the, the approaches, yeah. why is the school doing this? Why does the school do that? Why do we have this curriculum? Why do we make that scheduling decision? If parents yeah. knew more about it, then they'd be able to make perhaps some better decisions um, as well at home and, and, and around, the, around the parenting. But I think there's a, a, a taboo there perhaps where nobody really, nobody feels comfortable about coming along and telling a parent how to raise their child, right? Nobody is, is kind of, it's a very touchy subject. <laughs> I know, I know. So we didn't go that far. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder, you talked about, uh, we talked about um, the difference in communicating with, with young children and having to have that extra empathy and uh, being able to recognize and, and understand the, the, the child's perspective, which is very different from the adult's perspective, having patience, all of those things. Um, do you find or do you feel that your experience teaching young children has had any effect on the way that you interact with other adults whether that's parents that you speak to or colleagues at school or just in your social life do you feel that you you have any particular communication style that's that's special because you have a you spend so much time teaching children hmm that's a good question <laughs> i haven't think about that <laughs> um 
Maybe I should ask your friends. Ask your husband. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they would tell me. Uh, well, in a way, but in a way, I think because, uh, um, well, I think I have really patience with the, yeah, right. with many many things. You know, it's either your partner or your social relationship yeah. with other people or or members of the family. Um, I think it's also in a, impacted me in a way to change my behavior in a way on how to okay. interact with adult right and yeah. also not take life too seriously you know yeah right and and just be like a child sometimes in love yeah, and yeah, in yeah. Like little little moments and yeah 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 i just realized that no that's yeah, that's interesting because yeah. it struck me a bit earlier when you were talking about some of these things it struck me that maybe you know we talked about the the, the importance of being patient if you're going to teach in the early years it strikes me that maybe that's something we could all benefit from if we were all a little bit more patient and a little bit more relaxed and took life a little bit less seriously uh it's something that we could all i think benefit from right yeah 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 mm, that's a good point that's a good point yeah yeah <laughs> So no, maybe I will think about more of that after. <laughs> yeah, it might be useful. Yeah, um, yeah. So do you do you have a background in childhood development or psychology or anything like that? Um, I took my master's in early childhood you did, um, yeah. education. Okay. And uh, um, I'm planning to take my um, doctorate degree okay. later. Okay. And um, we'll see how it goes, you know, but. I would love to really have a bigger experience in a in a French uh, environment. Oh, okay. To, sure. You know, since I'm here, and uh, because it's it's quite a little different from Asian culture. Yeah. You know, and they have a different approach as well. They're yeah. Really so would I be right to assume that you had a very theoretical uh, study experience? Would did you your your study was very kind of textbook based or is that not the case it's more of a because i was working that time so okay. it was like like 50 online and 50 you know okay. in class mm -hmm. um it's it, it's also more an application right okay well that's good yeah yeah so yeah, do you yeah. do you feel now that your study especially your master's i suppose which is you know a very formal um qualification do you do you feel that that genuinely helped you and prepared you for teaching yes exactly exactly yeah. um i believe that it's not about what you already know because mm -hmm. you are learning in, in every cases and i think i am more into experiences sure because I know every job details or every environment you can get something from. Right. And I'm, I'm always open to, right. to different experiences. And it's, it's um, applicable in my situation as well, because coming from the Philippines and then working in Thailand and then now in Europe. Mm -hmm. So it's a good, uh, it's a good um, guide for me to build a, a good, uh, let's say resume wise, you know, experience yeah, right. wise. And later in my life, um, we'll see how it goes, but uh, depends also on where I am. Right, so, sure. uh, for example, in Thailand, um, there's a lot of earlier job, international, lots, lots of international schools. In Europe, you cannot just get a job right away without any right. qualifications, right. without any of these papers, blah, blah, blah. So in a way, it, it's hard as well. But, you know, once you get into the system, it, it helps right. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, yeah, yeah. And yeah. What, do you, what were you going to say about the difference? You said you'd, you'd still like to learn a lot more and get more experience in the, the French environment in particular. What are the big differences that you found um about about teaching in france compared to your time in thailand and in asia well here they believe in and the rules and regulations and i think especially when you are working in a public school 
you have to follow the government um, yeah. setup. You know, right. you cannot just say, "Hey, I want to change this." So, probably if you work in a private school, you have more ways to say. Mm -hmm. You know, I would suggest that yeah, right, right. you can do this, and and one day I hope it will change because they are more into really um really serious format they are like okay a b c you know right okay why not sometimes we adapt a certain um curriculum that is really um really really work in different yeah. levels of, of of the child's learning mm -hmm. so i don't have any problem with the rules it's just that probably it will benefit more in the near future if we have an open mind of adapting a certain curriculum, especially yeah, right, I see. the learning, uh, play through learning instead of just in one box, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. 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 You've mentioned play a few times. Is, is play a concept that's well recognized and appreciated in, in France or not? The idea of incorporating play into the learning? In some school, yes, yes, yes. But uh, um, I didn't do a lot of research about that here, but I can see that they are more into the outcome. Right, yeah, okay. So, and, and the school of my son as well, like, uh, of course, they have a, you know, certain structures to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is, well, okay, it, it's good, but in a way that's very old <laughs> we right. need to change yeah. that you need yeah. to adapt the new way of learning you know yeah look at finland look at other scandinavian countries there are right. more way up because right. they are open to a new kind of system on how to yeah. evaluate the grades or the yeah. outcome or yeah. the assessment it seems, of yeah it seems to me that that openness is the key um i i think um one mistake ha has been, I've seen a little bit of it here, not that it's been implemented, but it's been talked about. Um, some some countries and some systems um, have the idea that they might go to Finland and just kind of copy things and bring them back. Um, and I think that that's a mistake. As, as, as brilliantly as they might be doing in Finland, I think trying to copy it is, is not the way forward. Um, but the openness, I think, is the, the, the one thing that they've done well, or the, the foundation to what they've done well is just kind of going back to the drawing board with an open mind and any country can do that any country can just open yeah. open up and, and they might come yeah. up with something very very different from what finland's doing they might decide to create an entirely different completely new system that's unlike yeah. anything in anywhere else in the world but the the, the, the yeah. key thing is the openness and so far for you know a couple of hundred years in the entire world education has been a very closed system a very closed-minded system um yes and that, that's, that's been my observation yeah. yeah yeah exactly exactly also in the philippines as well it's yeah that's why um let's say that hopefully the near you know scenario of our education yeah. system would, would change yeah i hope so too i see some potential for that um yeah, exactly. You've talked obviously about spending time in a few different countries now. You, you're from the Philippines. You taught in Thailand. You now live and teach in France. Um, what kind of experience have you had or what kind of challenges have you faced in, I suppose, more in France, but maybe in Thailand, I don't know. Um, but in France, being, being Asian and being a non-native speaker, um, how has that affected your career? Any challenges that you faced in your, uh, in your career? And, 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 and how did it, uh, did it affect you in Thailand at all? Uh, well, um, in Thailand, there's always a, a different scenario between a native and non-native. Yeah. Like, so that will be in a later discussion. But it's true that um, it's the mindset of... Right of almost everyone there, especially the education, uh, the Ministry of Education, rather. And I don't take it seriously when I was there because it will 
make you crazy you know it, it happens a lot yeah right. but um as long as you're doing your job you're you're happy and you don't let other people really you know squash you in a way that disrespect mm. you and yeah, i think right. everything is everything is good um in france uh well it it's also kind of mindset if you are not native right it will be also some sort of difficulty for you to actually get a job right because the government says so blah 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 mm. however mm. um you can you can uh, right, find can. a job here as long right. as you have the papers mm. and you have the qualification is is yeah. not it's not impossible yeah yeah and are there a lot of um teachers like yourself in france is, is there a lot of competition amongst qualified non-native teachers like yourself or or not there are lots yes there, there are, are lots yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um with you know as a member of Tassel france mm, okay also we are trying to 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 share with the community that we knew applied for a job and they put okay we hire non-native or you know we, we erase that we delete that and we right. try to yeah. include it people and different backgrounds and you know as long as you are qualified of doing the job and but um there are many non-native here and really okay. educated people and professional people and they're doing a lot of great job with their work yeah. so that's yeah. not a problem that's not an issue actually okay. and also i wonder you you teach english obviously um i'm from england and we have um there are some I, i'm sure you're probably aware living in france there is uh some some pretty strong stereotypes between england and, and france we we have a, a long-standing relationship uh, one of the things that we uh are, we we say about the french um is that the french they don't seem to really want to learn english um in the way that you know english is often recognized as being the global the international language um it's the language a lot of countries kind of put you know put a lot of money into developing their english ability um france on a kind of a social cultural level um we have this sense that the french aren't interested in learning english but obviously you're an english teacher i wonder in the education system um what's the what's the the role and the value and the attitude towards english what, what have you seen there well uh when i first came here um obviously i don't speak french that yet mm. but um we knew we when, when i tried to communicate with the locals it would just seems to be like yeah oh, well, well what are you talking about <laughs> yeah. like you know like oh who's this alien so as a foreigner it's important if you want to live longer and adapt the culture you need to learn the language it's simil sure. similar to thailand mm -hmm. i don't sure. know indonesia but in thailand as well you need to learn thai because once you are working in a public school and a lot of kids primary or high school or even university level they don't understand anything yeah, at right, all right right so it's a frustration in part of teacher like you're talking endlessly in front of them they're like yeah nothing's going on right, you know right, yeah yeah so it's it's a uh, i think when you work here it's kind of similar in a way unless you're teaching university students that have knowledge already have knowledge of yeah. the english language yeah i know that french people they're kind of really proud of their language right right exactly and and, and whenever i'm with my family members i am adapting myself to to speak the language right. even if right. i'm not fluent in french so sure. Sure. But I said, well, if I don't speak French, I have to speak English too. Mm -hmm. You know, I tried yeah, to yeah. have it kind of like a sure, yeah, because, sure. yeah, like you know, um, it's not the only language in the world to yeah, learn. Yeah, yeah, you have yeah. to learn English as well. Yeah, yeah. And what about <laughs> so, the students in school? Are they are they keen to learn English? Do they want to learn English? Do they enjoy learning English or not? 
Ah, yes, 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 yes. Yeah. The children they are really keen to 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 learn the language because most of these parents they live abroad. Right, so in an international like, school, especially. Yeah, yeah. So the experts coming back to to France, and so mm. they prefer a school that has more international yeah. way. And so yes, uh, they love the children to to learn English. Yeah, right. Okay. It's, okay. it's good. Yeah. It's good. Okay. Good. 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 The new generation is more open. Yeah, I think that I think a lot of things change generationally. I, I've noticed a lot of changes just during my time here in Indonesia since I started teaching. Um, and just as a new generation has come along, and I've been here for just over ten years now. Um, and I've seen a big change just with the, the younger kids that are now growing up. Um, a lot of changes about their attitudes towards education, their cultural attitudes, yeah. their political attitudes. Um, it's certainly generational yeah. changes have a big impact yeah. on, on learning, I think. Yeah. yeah. They are competitive, yeah. Yeah. And you must see the same in your, your, your son is 12, you said. So he must be now reaching that age of having a, 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 you know, a strong personality and strong opinions. Oh yeah, he has a personality. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah, 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 yeah. And what do you do with um, him about uh, about his uh, Filipino heritage? Does he learn a lot about? Does he kind of understand where he comes from, and and does he have a, a kind of a, a sense of his Filipino identity or not? Uh, yes, but we don't. I don't speak Filipino to him right, at home. Right, right, right. So. Uh, to be honest, sometimes I forget my own language too. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah but yeah. um yeah, but um living abroad for so many years, you know, your your mindset, your language, personality, it's just totally different from ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. with him, it's a good opportunity with him because living in Thailand and then now in in, in, in Europe, it's a big opportunity learning uh, the local language as well, and going to international school for free. Right. It, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's really, really, really a good opportunity. And we're so happy that he has this kind of, you know, experience. Um, in terms of language, he's at that age, I think, I know he can learn, but I think he doesn't practice often. Because it's a, it's a bilingual school. Right. They have sure. an English section and French section. But um, he's more comfortable to speak in English than yeah, in, in, yeah. in French. But hopefully later he will adapt, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, okay. It's really good for for children to have a different kind of cultural diversity yeah definitely definitely i i imagine you must see um just just not just in your son but just working in an international school environment you must see a lot of um tolerance right amongst the students just a a, a, a high kind of awareness of cultures and a high tolerance for cultures is that something that you recognize yeah yeah, yeah exactly in my old school um i've had the kids from Japan, Italy, French, oh. different like like diversity is, is is wide. Yeah. And whenever we have a certain occasion, you know, they would dress up in their own um, culture, um, traditional yeah. way, wow. and it's good. And sometimes they speak their own language, and so okay. it opens um, my own perspective as well in a way yeah yeah that, that's great yeah. yeah it's not just like them but me as well so yeah, that's I, I like this kind of scenario i like this experience because i don't focus in just one background right you handle different kind of dnas and different cultural backgrounds yeah absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah which is very yeah, different yeah. from my i've had uh, you know i've had students from a number of different cultures and when i now when I do teacher training, I get some, I train some teachers from different countries. Uh, but the, you know, the, the major part of my teaching career has been here in Indonesia with mostly Indonesian students. Um, and teaching English in a, an EFL environment, which, you know, a single culture EFL environment is, um, it's very different 
because as an English teacher, I'm sure you'll do the same as a language teacher. We all, we always kind of advocate for the importance of yeah. the, the cultural learning as well. When you're learning a foreign yeah. language, you kind of have to learn the culture that goes with it a little bit. Um, but there is, it's difficult to do that in an, in a single culture EFL environment. Yeah. You find that the kids, even the kids that learn well and they develop well and they progress quickly, um, yeah they do often lack the cultural awareness that go that often goes with language learning and in an esl environment or a more international environment because i've not spent exactly. a lot of time in international schools only a, a, a you know a few months here and there um in a in those environments the cultural awareness is much stronger i think but in the in the efl uh single culture schools you find that they might be learning english they might be kind of you know developing their their, their english um kind of academically but they are lacking in the, the cultural side of things often. Yeah, exactly. I totally agree. Um, I would prefer that kind of scenario. Yeah. If I, you know, give it a choice than a single, you know, cultural. Mm. Yeah. Um, compared to diversity of a different background. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. it's great to have that kind of experience. Uh, I really love it. I really enjoy that, that uh, different students and, it's just uh, happy moments for me. Yeah. 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 Good. Great. Is there anything else you, you want to talk about, Emma? Is there anything you think we haven't covered? Uh, I think we're good. Yeah. Good. Uh, look, we touched on uh, some of your experiences as a, as a non-native English teacher. Um, but I think that's something I want to, uh, I mentioned earlier, I think that's something I want to have. A, a, a conversation about specifically on that topic in the near future um and i think i'll probably have multiple guests on for that uh would you would, would you be interested in maybe coming and joining in with that yeah that would be great yeah 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 good. yeah good great um and is there anything before we finish is there anything uh anywhere you want to point the the audience anywhere they can find you anywhere they should uh any websites they should visit or anything like that well, um, I have a certain groups and uh, social media like Facebook about English teachers around the world. Oh yeah, you okay. know, looking for jobs, opportunities, yeah, good, or okay. just online networking. Mm -hmm. And then it, it's called English teachers around the world. Okay, good. And then for non-native or Filipinos, I also have community like that based in Thailand that I've okay. um, we founded when I was there. And uh, we have Tassel friends, if you are in France, yeah, nice. and okay, friends, please, please yeah. join us. We will have a November uh, a gathering soon this oh, year. Okay. Okay. So hopefully, uh, yeah, hopefully. Uh, it's going to be good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Um, so if you are in France, uh, please join Tassel good. friends. You can find it online. Easy to Great. register if you want to become a member and join us. Probably a face-to-face -face meetup. Yeah, great. Good. Uh, we'll, we'll put links uh, with the video later then and people can check those down underneath okay. the video. Um, all right. Well, brilliant. Thanks very much, Emma. Uh, Thank you so much, for Carl. Talking. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll have you back very soon to, uh, to join in on that panel discussion. Lovely. Thank you so much. All right. Bye now. Bye-bye.